Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Martina Lyons, and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. Hopefully, most of you know uh, IRENA, but uh, in case not, we are an intergovernmental organization with 160 member countries. Uh, we support these countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, center of excellence, repository of policy, technology resource and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Our analytical work and our engagement with our members generate a lot of valuable insights and we are constantly looking for more ways to share those insights. This is why two weeks ago we launched as a pilot a new fortnightly IRENA Insights webinar program. So every other week, presenters from one of IRENA's team, either alone or together with their invited guests, will share with you key findings from their latest work, will offer you insights into opportunities, trends, best practices, but also innovative solutions to address various challenges. We aim to keep these webinars short, approximately 30 minutes maximum, so we cannot cover everything, but we do hope to give you enough to decide whether to delve deeper, and we will signpost further sources of more in-depth information to, to help you do that. So today's webinar, Electric Vehicles and How Smartly Should We Charge Them, will explore the synergies between electric vehicles and renewable energy and how electrifying transport can aid to the decarbonization of both transport and power sectors. Uh, we will focus on smart charging and its key role in unlocking flexibility from electric vehicles to use more solar and wind power. Our speakers today are Ms. Arina Anizie, who is our EV expert at the Arena's innovation team, and Mr. Francisco Bochel, our expert and team lead on renewable energy technology, standards, and markets. Their presentation will be 20 minutes long to allow 10-minute session for questions and answers. Before I hand over the microphone to Arina and Francisco, I have a few housekeeping items which I would like to cover. So first, today's webinar will be recorded and available together with a presentation slide on IRENA website. The previous webinar recording and slides are already there and the link will be shared with you in the follow-up email. All of you are currently muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. We would love to hear from you during uh, today's presentation. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please, please feel free to send it through the question feature that you can find on the webinar panel. We will be monitoring the question throughout the session and select some to be answered. But due to the time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered. You may also download the report. Uh, this presentation is based on in the handout section. And if you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in via phone um, you can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel. If your technical difficulties remain unresolved, you may uh, also write to us through the chat section and we will try to help you. So without any further ado, let me kick things off by welcoming Arina and Francisco. Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martina, and welcome everyone. Uh, let me start this webinar by saying that in the ongoing energy transformation towards a decarbonized and sustainable energy sector, at present we observe important progress in the electricity sector, particularly in the development of uh, employment of wind and solar PV technologies. And this progress is driven by policy targets, but also by their strong business case due to their uh, rapid uh, falling costs. Actually, in 2015, the share of wind and PV in global electricity generation was around 5%, and today the number has increased close to 10%. And in the Paris Agreement Alliance scenario, we expect that this share of uh, variable renewables, wind and solar photovoltaics, should be around 60% by 2050. Then we see the importance uh, to be prepared to integrate these high shares of uh, variable renewables in power in the power sector. And uh, this will require more flexible power systems and sources that provide such a flexibility. 
In today's webinar, we will look at how electric vehicles charging can actually be one of the sources of flexibility to integrate more renewables if they are properly managed. But of course, uh, the energy sector is not just about electricity. Actually, electricity at the moment represents only around 20% of the global total finally energy consumption. Energy end use sectors, the transport, buildings, industry sector, still very much rely on the direct use of uh, fuels. So we need to say that the sector with the most progress in the ongoing energy transition is the power sector. Uh, due to the ongoing growth in renewables uh, deployment for electricity generation. And now we need to increase the share of electricity in the end use sector to use this clean uh, energy carrier to decarbonize other sectors. And looking at the transport sector in our analysis, as we can see at the bottom of the chart on the screen, we expect that the share of electricity would increase from just around 1% at the moment to more than 40% by 2050. It's important to say that most of this uh, growth can be expected in the passenger cars uh, transport mode, so basically EVs. If we look at the EV market at the moment, in 2018 we had around 6 million electric vehicles on the road on the roads uh, worldwide. And at the end of uh, last year, we estimate that in 7.5 million EVs. And in our analysis, again, which is aligned with the Paris Agreement, we see that we will need around 160 million electric vehicles by 2030 and more than 1 billion by 2050. Okay, now if we see this from, a, not from a transport perspective, but from a power sector perspective, it also means that a massive electricity storage capacity would be available with all these batteries on wheels. Actually, batteries in EVs can dwarf a stationary battery capacity in 2050, with around 40 terawatt hours of uh, electric vehicle batteries that could potentially be available to provide grid services compared to just nine terawatt hours of stationary batteries. And this is indeed a great opportunity for the power sector transformation. But the other aspect that we need to consider is the charging infrastructure. So let's look at the public charging points infrastructure. Globally, we have close to 900,000 public charging points at the end of 2019. And looking closer to the European market, for example, 180,000 public charging points were available at the end of 2019 with countries like the Netherlands, Germany, France, UK, and Norway leading in deployment this charging infrastructure. So the average ratio of electric vehicles per charging point grew from 4.1 in 2014 to 8, 8 to 1 in 2019. So it means eight electric vehicles per charging point. So actually it's going in a trend that we had less charging points Per electric vehicle than before. Now, the, electric, uh, the European Commission expects around 1 million public charging points in Europe in 2025 to serve around 12 million electric vehicles uh, in the region. It means an even larger ratio of EVs per charging point, or better said, less charging points for uh, a number of uh, the number of electric vehicles. That also means that Europe would need to install around 500 public charging points every day for the next five years in order to achieve this goal. And in terms of investments, if we assume that most of these charging points will be normal charging points and only around 20% charging points, we would need to invest more than 15 billion euros in Europe to uh, deploy these uh, charging points. So as we see the market, it looks that is possible, but certainly it would need very bold policy and industry-wide efforts to achieve these goals. Okay, as we mentioned before, electric vehicles can create a vast electricity storage capacity, but of course, if everyone simultaneously charges their car in the morning or in the evenings, electricity networks can uh, become a stress. 
and then it will result in more uh, in, uh, investments in infrastructure, grid infrastructure, and less uh, opportunities to integrate renewables in power systems. So the timing of charging is critical. And this nexus between the topics we have discussed before, so number one, a clean electricity sector because of more wind and PV. Second, an ongoing growing trend of EV deployment coming from the transport sector. And third, big opportunities of investment in new charging infrastructure. The nexus between these three topics is the focus of our analysis, which is contained in the report, Innovation Outlook, Smart Charging for EVs, that you can download for free at our publications uh, website. But the key message of this uh, report is that to enable these benefits and synergies between these different aspects, a smart charging is critical. And a smart, charger, a smart charging comes not in a unique approach or fashion, but it can be implemented in different ways, from a more basic approaches to more advanced approaches. And that's what this chart on the screen tries to illustrate. The basic approaches on the top and going to the bottom of the chart, the most advanced uh, smart charging approaches. So we start, for example, with the time of use uh, pricing, what basically is just consumers encouraged to the further charging from peak to off-peak periods due to price signals. Uh, and then we have a direct control mechanism where we have more automated reaction uh, to price signals. And then we go to B1G, which is only directional control charging. And then finally, we go to uh, B2G and dynamic uh, pricing with automated control where you have a, a, or the whole system working automatically and not in just one direction, but also uh, going from the electric vehicle to the grid as well, providing the best services at the appropriate uh, time. Now I would like to pass it to my colleague, Arina, who will give you the details on our analysis. Thank you very much, Francisco, for the introduction. Yes, um, I will. Uh, uh, we will go a little bit more in depth, or of the key messages on, and uh, what uh, are yeah, what uh, are the the study we did in our report, uh, innovation out of uh, smart charging for electric vehicle. Uh, as uh, explained, there are two main um, uh, smart charging uh, options: unidirectional smart charging and bidirectional smart charging. And I would like to explain a little bit more how this bidirectional work, uh, smart charging works. Ex that is called vehicle to grid. Uh, we shall not forget that electric vehicles is actually an innovation for the transport sector. Its aims, first aim is to improve air quality, decrease pollution in the cities, and ultimately decarbonize the transport sector. However, uh, it is important that uh, to, to decarbonize the transport sector, it is important that electric vehicles are charged with, uh, with wind and solar electricity, with renewable and clean electricity. And, um, uh, vehicle to grid makes a lot of sense uh, in the case that uh, the cars are parked 90% of the time and uh, the battery is connected uh, to the grid for so long time that you, we can actually use the battery to offer some services back to the grid and help uh, e the grid increase flexibility and integrate more higher, sh higher share of wind and solar. So it's a, it, it would be a win-win situation for both transport sector and, uh, and power sector. Uh, what are the services that the car can uh, actually provide through ve vehicle to grid smart charging uh, are uh, listed here on, on this slide. In the left side of, uh, of the slide, uh, we can see how uh, electric vehicles can be used for peak shaving or for uh, as a backup for the grid. Uh, one electric vehicles can be used in a vehicle to home settings and help uh, uh, a single household. Uh, manage the self-consumption and uh, manage its electricity, con its electricity consumption. But uh, when many batteries are connected to the to the public grid uh, through aggregation, it that actually help the the entire system or the distribution uh, system operator manage better the grid. And um, we shall. Uh, uh, it's important that uh, market structure and regulation are in place to enable vehicle to grid uh, charging. Aggregators, as I said, are very important for uh, uh, being able to aggregate all these small batteries and sell the services in a competitive wholesale market. Um, I would like to mention that 
uh, this is specifically important because the the capacity of the of the batteries in electric vehicles are very small. So in order to participate in the wholesale market, we list at ne we need at least one megawatt to two megawatts uh, that need to be traded in the market. So this would mean that we will need around 500 electric vehicles to be uh, aggregated in order to uh, be able to compete in in the market and offer services. What services it can offer to the transmission system operator TSOs is uh, fast frequency control, primary reserves, and secondary reserves, which, yeah, the main motivation is to have the right incentives and to be remunerated for all these services. And to the DSO, it can provide voltage control and uh, congestion management via load shifting and peak shaving. Um, we have um, uh, made uh, an assessment on uh, what would be the impact of smart charging on grid infrastructure. And to illustrate this better, uh, we have uh, talked to a number of DSOs and uh, tried to get uh, first-hand uh, real information on, uh, on, on this. So uh, I will present the case from uh, the DSO of Hamburg. Uh, Hamburg is at uh, present the city with the highest number of charging points in Germany. We have uh, last year, at the end of last year, there were 100 uh, charging points in households and 810 public charging points. And according to the DSO assessment, uh, uh, at an electric vehicle penetration level of 9%, 15% of the feed feeders in the city will be overloaded. So in order to reinforce, uh, to, to reinforce the grid, DSO would need to invest up to 20 million euros for, for this, uh, for grid reinforcement to avoid the um, uh, constraints in the grid. However, there is a smart control solution, smart digital solution that uh, costs only 2 million euro, and it solves the problem by basically decreasing the simultaneity, meaning that the number of electric vehicles that are charged at the same time would decrease by, di by uh, DSOs directly controlling the, the charging points and the load. Uh, yeah, for this solution, uh, DSO in, in Hamburg partnered with, with Siemens, who will insta install 30 control units and monitor the private charging infrastructure load. So we can see that it's actually a high impact of smart charging solutions in, in the distribution system operator to reduce uh, grid congestion at a much lower cost than investing in, uh, in the grid, the traditional uh, solution. Um, we also looked in, uh, in our uh, study on what would be actually the impact of smart charging on solar PV and wind integration. And for this, we, we modeled an imaginary system uh, to see what is actually this impact of the system le level. We, we took an extreme case, a small isolated system with very high share of solar generation and very high share of wind generation and no other flexibility option considered, just to see what is the maximum potential. And um, our um, uh, results show that smart charging, both vehicle to grid and both directional and unidirectional and bidirectional, V1G and V2G, a smart charging enables uh, to cover the EV load with higher share of solar and wind and contributes to reduce the yearly peak load and also uh, reducing the, the curtailment. By reducing the curtailment and the yearly peak load, we also achieve an a, a lower marginal cost and so it's so translating in lower electricity prices and um, another uh, uh, maybe interesting uh, finding is that uh, smart charging of vehicle to grid especially uh, have, has a higher impact on uh, on PV uh, uh, dominated system than wind uh, gener mainly due to generation profiles because uh, the electric vehicles would be basically used as a battery and it's easier to predict uh, yeah, when the solar is generating to store the electricity in the battery and use it at the later hours when the mobility needs uh, elect electricity. Um, <clears throat> very important for, uh, for electric vehicle deployment is uh, naturally the charging infrastructure. And this is maybe one of the main uh, burdens uh, to faster deploy and accelerate the deployment of charging infrastructure of uh, electric vehicles. The fact that uh, the consumer still is, uh, yeah, feels a little bit uh, 
uh, range anxiety that uh, he cannot uh, charge the electric vehicles when, whenever needed. Uh, we helped a little bit. We tried to map uh, what would be the criteria and how the policymaker can uh, uh, f foster this uh, the deployment of charging infrastructure and what would be the main the key points to consider when looking at this. And one question to answer is how to charge the electric vehicles. What type of uh, of uh, smart uh, of uh, charging infrastructure is needed? Um, do we need slow charging in the, in the city? Do we need uh, fast charging or uh, uh, ultra fast charging? Uh, obviously, fast and ultra fast charging are a priority for mob mobility sector, as the consumer wants to, the driver would like to have it charged as, as uh, soon as possible, uh, as in traditional uh, um, settings. Uh, but slow charging is much better suited for smart charging. So it really needs to uh, change the behavior of the consumer in able to uh, be able to harness the synergies between uh, mobility and wind and solar. And, um, and uh, yeah, fast charging, uh, it's uh, increasing stress on the local grids and few ways to, to mitigate this is by uh, introducing battery swapping strategies, charging station with buffer storage might be also a solution and uh, so on. There's several uh, options to actually uh, to still install fast charging that is much needed especially on the highways but uh, mitigate the the stress that you can uh, yeah um, um, put on the local grids um, another question very important for policymakers and for for uh, yeah to be when deploying the charging infrastructure to be answered is where where it's best to to place these charging uh, stations and it uh, here it it may very much depends on the setting of the of the of the city whether it's a low income with a dense population area probably there will not be so many private owned cars and then uh, the the focus should be on uh, how to charge the public transportation with public uh, charging or even hubs for buses to charge uh, in uh, high income uh, sub uh, suburban sprawl probably uh, the the number of electric vehicles, private private electric vehicles, will be higher, and then we should focus mostly on home charging. Would be the main focus. Whether in high income but dense uh, metropolitan areas, uh, we should also look more at uh, charging hubs, uh, stations, and the most more, more fast charging. As home charging will not be a solution, as no as not everybody will have the place to to charge its car at home due to space uh, concerns. Um, in this uh, study, we also projected possible evolution of electric vehicles flexibility by 2030 and 2050. And while today the electric vehicle penetration is generally low and smart charging applications are not so developed yet, we see that in uh, 2030 a higher EV penetration will, uh, will occur with larger and more efficient batteries and more developed smart charging uh, appliances. Positive aspect is also that the vehicles will, as today, be standing idle most of the time with the battery connected to the grid, which will increase, uh, which will give more possibilities for vehicle to grid and smart charging. However, but by 2050, we foresee that innovations are also emerging in the transport sector and will change the dynamics of uh, how the electric vehicles are connected to the grid. Considering that autonomous vehicle will emerge together with the principles of sharing economy meaning that people will not own a car, but mobility will be mostly seen as a service than a property. The number will be, will, of vehicles will decrease and their time for being connected to the grid will also decrease. And this will, will have a, a negative impact on, on how much flexibility uh, the, the cars will be able to provide to the grid. I would like to end uh, this uh, short uh, presentation with uh, some guidelines that guidance guidelines that uh, we uh, formulated for policymakers that uh, would would like to yeah to to in incentivize and deploy uh, smart charging and uh, electric vehicles in uh, in in the cities and countries. First, it's very important to promote renewable energy uh, hand in hand with promoting the uh, electric vehicles. Both should go hand in hand and Support for charging infrastructure is key here um, because we, there is no clear business model, pri business model, private business model for, for this, for private entities. So uh, public support, it's very important for deploying charging infrastructure. Uh, 
then um, we should focus on they should focus on smart charging and how to create incentives to tap large incremental benefits especially from the solar use uh, smart charging strategies are uh, are are very important to be developed uh, according to the power mix in uh, in the system in the power system and uh, last but not least uh, studies uh, should be made to see how the impact of long-term evolution of mobility will uh, be on uh, on the power sector and on smart charging. Integrating planning of power and transport sector is uh, is also a key aspect. Um, if uh, if you want to read more about our our studies, uh, as as we mentioned, me and Francisco, we last year we. Uh, launch this innovation outlook smart charging for electric vehicles that you can find uh, available online free of charge to, uh, on our website uh, we also have uh, published an innovation landscape for a renewable power future a study that looks at different various innovation that can increase flexibility in the power sector and the electric vehicle smart charging is one of them so we looked at, uh, at this innovation with, and synergies with uh, other innovations. It's a very interesting study if you want to see a bigger picture of how to increase higher, uh, how to increase the wind and solar in uh, in power systems. And for each of the innovations um, captured in this uh, big landscape report, we also uh, developed a separate uh, shorter brief. So obviously we have also a brief on uh, on electric vehicle smart charging. Uh, as part of uh, this big innovation landscape project. You can find all these uh, uh, reports online, so feel free to, to take a look on our website. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for your time, and now I hand it, uh, yeah, now it's question and answer. Thank you, uh, Francisco and Arina, for a very insightful uh, presentation. Let me go directly to the questions. We have already received several ones. I would like to thank everyone for, for posting questions. Let me start with this one. Will vehicle to grid also require higher ratios electric vehicles to public charging points to ensure an acceptable number of vehicles connected to the grid at any given moment? Yeah, thanks, Martina. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a key question. So in the presentation, we mentioned that, for example, in, in Europe, we see a, a ratio of a, eight electric vehicles per charging point. And actually, if we really want to have these vehicles connected almost all the time, of course, we would need at least one charging point per, per vehicle. So from eight to one to one to one. But actually for vehicle to grid, if you want close to 100% of the time the, the vehicle connected to the grid, you actually will need not just your uh, home charge point for every electric vehicle, but you would also need at least one charging point per car at your workplace. So they are also connected at work. So at least two charging points per electric vehicles and possibly even three in commercial areas like supermarkets or shopping malls, etc. So possibly three. So between two to three charging points uh, per electric vehicle. So it means that actually to fully deploy B2G, we really need to scale up massively the charging infrastructure. Of course, the other option is that you don't account uh, for your uh, charging infrastructure for all the number of electric vehicles you have, but just uh, a share of those, yeah, depending on the on the charging infrastructure you have. But yes, for for B2G, you need massive uh, investment in, in charging infrastructure if you want 100% um, availability of all the electric vehicles. Thank you, Francisco. Very interesting. Another question: What business models do already exist for the deployment of the charging infrastructure? Yeah, should I start this? I um, already mentioned, uh, I think in my presentation, there is indeed um, a challenge for business model for charging infrastructure. It's uh, some, I, I have been talked with some experts and some think that actually the only business model at the moment is uh, buying and selling electricity uh, as any retailer through the charging point. This is, however, not enough uh, to, to incentivize uh, and accelerate the deployment of charging infrastructure. That's why we think that one key uh, 
yeah, one key is that public uh, support is needed for uh, for deploying charging infrastructure in terms of incentives, in terms of grants, uh, or even uh, that private public sector could uh, take the initiative to deploy uh, the charging infrastructure. We have been talking also with uh, the city of Amsterdam. They are most advanced in uh, in charging infrastructure points. Uh, deployment and uh, they are actually uh, think that it's their responsibility as uh, as the city of uh, of the public yeah pu public sector and the city of Amsterdam is there is their responsibility to take uh, care of the public space and uh, make sure that uh, uh, yeah these public uh, charging infrastructures uh, are available for everyone needed so they are uh, installing and investing in uh, in in the charging infrastructure and allowing everyone to access it um, now, of course, uh, there are different private companies that are also investing in it. Uh, some of them are uh, having a strategy to lock in the consumer via different applications, via the charging systems, uh, the, yeah, the charging uh, cables that are only compatible to one type of, of car. Um, this is a strategy. I don't think in long term it will last because uh, it's duplicating infrastructure in a way, and we should make sure that all the public charging points offer public access to, to everyone equally. Um, maybe Francisco would like to add something on uh, more insights from- yeah, Maybe to add three, three points. No? Uh, the first one maybe is also, especially for home charging infrastructure, to consider um, regulatory support. Uh, and here two aspects, one is actually incentives as many countries like the UK, Germany and others are going to give um, a, to cover part of the upfront uh, cost of installing a charging point which is smart at your home. But also the other challenge that uh, homeowners are, or car owners sorry, are, are facing is that uh, if they have a parking place, it is not ready to uh, install a, a charging point. And they need to also cover not just the cost of the charging point, but also sometimes some infrastructural aspects to actually make it available. So in terms of regulation, we are seeing that, for example, in the US, now the building codes for uh, every new building, they need, they would need to be um, ready for uh, the installation of home charging points. And that's a, a very important uh, development that is happening. The second point in terms of uh, business models is that um, the, as Arina was mentioning, the business model of basically a revenue from selling electricity is interesting, particularly for a smart charging. But for a slow charging is not so attractive. But we need um, to engage with other uh, actors uh, that maybe uh, are uh, very well placed to uh, be part of this business opportunity and maybe have not seen this opportunity yet. For example, the owners of parking places in municipalities. Yeah? Uh, it could be uh, that they can charge just a, a marginal amount uh, of uh, the parking fee for um, uh, charging uh, in their parking lot and every a parking space in the parking lot can be provided with a slow charging, low cost a charging point. Yeah? So we need also to see how to engage other actors that might uh, get a, an interesting business model from that. And the third point is actually very interesting. We have seen uh, last two weeks here in Europe, uh, some, for example, a car manufacturer from Sweden is uh, offering here in Germany that if you buy an electric car from there, from them, they would actually uh, install the home charging point uh, for you through a, a local partner. So we are seeing that now also uh, car manufacturers are seeing a business opportunity there. Of course, not so interesting in terms of the charging point, but as a, a hook, let's say, to get more uh, co uh, clients to buy electric vehicles from uh, their brand. So these are some examples of some uh, regulatory and business opportunities we are seeing here in Europe and in the US. And of course, maybe also interesting to mention is that many oil and gas companies are transitioning and installing uh, electric vehicle smart charging points in the uh, gas stations. So it's part of a larger business model and they're just incorporating uh, the innovation and installing charging infrastructure also in their yeah, premises. Thank you very much. 
I would ask probably two more questions. Uh, one is, how is it possible that Norway has con convincingly the most EVs in Europe, but they are just the fifth in the number of public charging points? Thanks, Martina. Yeah, this is uh, also a good question. Um, Norway uh, certainly leads in Europe in terms of share of electric vehicles uh, in the total uh, passenger car fleet. But of course, the numbers we saw in the slide was about absolute number, not uh, the share. And that is where the difference is because, of course, the total passenger car stock in Norway is at the moment around maybe 3.5 million uh, vehicles on the roads, while, for example, in France is maybe around 35 million, and in Germany, maybe more than 40 million uh, vehicles on the roads. Yeah. So despite in France and, and Germany, we may have lower shares of electric vehicles in contrast to the whole stock in absolute numbers, um, is bigger, and of course, the number of vehicles, but also the number of, of charging points, etc. But indeed, Norway is a leader in the region uh, in terms of electric mobility. Thank you. And one more question. How should EV charging be implemented? Should it be through a retail contract or DSO connection agreement? What are your views on this? Um, well, I think it could be actually a combination of both. Uh, if uh, the system is under stress and there is an urgent need to intervene in order to keep the system balanced, Maybe a DSO connection agreement is useful here. So the DSO has direct access to, to control the load and to stabilize back the grid. But otherwise, uh, it should probably be uh, more of on a competitive basis and through the retail market and a retail contract that uh, the consumer could decide uh, which services or in which markets they would like to, to participate and uh, how smart the car should, should be charged based on their preference, the remuneration available, the competition in, in the market, and yeah, different, uh, different aspects. So I think Germany is one country that is developing uh, now a, a regulation that allows uh, DSO to have direct uh, control on, uh, on the loads of the electric vehicles through, through a connection agreement. Uh, but as far as I am aware of, this is only the, uh, the only country that is uh, having this approach. The, in Amsterdam, as I, as I mentioned, one example that we are more familiar with and in other countries, they're more op the, they're opt more for a, a retail contract and to leave uh, the consumer to choose what kind of uh, uh, service they would like to, and with, with which retail they would like to engage. Maybe at the end also to consider that this is an aspect also basically of, of uh, how this market is evolving and the regulation is appropriately set. At the end of the day, it should be just that you have a, a clear set of technical specifications and codes, electrical building codes that comply with the needs also of the uh, distribution system operators and the other actors to ensure the uh, reliability of the, of the system. And then you, with that requirements, you are safe and then you let the market to work. You have your retailers, you can decide from where you want to buy it, cleaner, cheaper, etc. But basically what is also important is to have clear uh, set of regulations, requirements, specifications and codes in place to work together. And of course, always the cooperation and the dialogue between the different uh, actors. Thank you so much. So many insightful questions to choose from, but unfortunately the time is up. So let me thank today's speaker for their captivating presentation and very pertinent questions we received from the audience. We hope that the insight our colleagues shared uh, with you are of uh, great value to all of you. I have a couple of final announcements. Uh, to be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and ways to improve it, we would appreciate your feedback. Um, we would like to invite you to complete a very short satisfactory survey, which will appear at the end of the webinar and which will be, which will be shared with you in the follow-up email. Thank you in advance for that. And last but not least, we would like to invite you 
all to our next edition of this webinar series on where the renewable energy innovation is heading and what patents can tell us. It will take place in two weeks uh, on Tuesday, again on Tuesday, at on 4th of February at 10 a.m. Central European time. You can already register on our IRENA website and the link will be again shared with you in our follow-up email. Once again, we thank you all for attending this webinar session. Goodbye and see you soon. Thank you.